All right, so this is the third talk in the programming language design session of Uppsala. And I would like to acknowledge this fact by starting to talk about blockchains. If you, well, all of you obviously heard what blockchains are, and I need to give an, uh, I, I'm not going to give long enough introduction. So uh, blockchains are actually a pretty easy idea in the core. So we have an unordered set of events, let's call them transactions, and we want to get an ordered set of events. And this is everything that blockchains do. Well, obviously they do it in a slightly more convoluted way. So they run a consensus protocol, and this is an ordered set that multiple parties are going to agree on. But this is essentially it. And those elements that are referred to as transactions can be literally anything. Well, in the life, the things are a little bit more complicated. Uh, in the practice, these multiple parties, they don't exactly agree on, the, on where each particular transaction comes in the set. Instead, they agree on an order of packages of these transactions known as blocks. To be more precise, blocks are actually uh, ordered backwards, but this is it. So the blockchain consensus protocol is something that allows to agree on the order of so blocks, and as long as the blocks contain transactions, that also allows to uh, agree on the order of the transactions. Why this is an interesting technology, and why people are so much excited about it? Well, the idea is that what exactly can we express as those transactions that we agree up, uh, upon? So transactions themselves, these are just simple computations that are executed locally, and as such, they alter the replicated state that all of the parties involved in the protocol have. And in the simplest case, the transactions coming from the world of finance are just transfers of funds between certain accounts uh, from A to B. And the reason why we need a distributed consensus protocol for that is to prevent what's called double spending. In a sense, all the parties need to agree who paid whom and how much and that the same amount of currency hasn't been used twice by the same party. But that was just the beginning of this idea. And since then, things started to get only interesting. So soon people realized that using the same uh, mechanism, you can do proper replicated computations. And the experiments with uh, ways to express those replicated computations have begun. And the name has been coined uh, and those replicated computations are nowadays commonly referred to as smart contracts. So smart contracts is something that has many appearances in the press nowadays. Uh, it's probably the easiest way to think of them uh, as of just stateful mutable objects that are replicated via consensus protocol where each of the parties have their own copy of the state and they all need to agree on how these objects are evolving over the time. So uh, since this uh, application came from, uh, from the finance, a typical component that state always has a certain amount of funds or currency that um, the parties need to agree on. But there are other interesting usages, such as running crowdfunding campaigns, doing voting, doing multi-party accounting, uh, even uh, going as far as implementing puzzle-solving games and distributing multiple rewards. So since this is a such um, a versatile idea, uh, many platforms that initially were just targeting the distributed consensus via blockchain have provided support for smart contracts. Uh, here are some of them. You must have heard of Ethereum, but there are other players in this market, such as Thesius, Concordium, and Facebook, uh, with the Libra proposal recently entered the market too. If, you've, if you have never seen uh, what a smart contract looks like, well, here's one. So this one is written in Solidity, which is a high-level language used to program on top of the Ethereum blockchain consensus protocol. And since it's Uppsala, it's probably heartwarming to realize that this is very similar to the standard object-oriented model. So the contract is merely uh, a class uh, that comes with a number of mutable fields. Here, for example, we have an owner of, that, of such contract that is identified by address, and it also has a map of assets saying how much different parties hold currency in this uh, account. There is a constructor, and there is a single entry point uh, depending on how this contract, uh, determining how this contract might evolve over time. And you can recognize that it's very similar to a method in languages such as Java or Scala. So here is the function called invest that allows uh, multiple parties to uh, contribute money into these contracts. So having pioneered by the Ethereum platforms, the smart contracts have been now perceived with a number of givens that most of the community agrees that this is how things should be. And these are the givens of smart contracts. First of all, what I've shown was the high-level language. In practice, uh, the smart contracts are deployed on the blockchain using a low-level language. And the reason for that is that it's nice to have a uniform compilation target. So if you want, you can write your contracts in Solidity. But 
you might as well write them in Haskell or in Scala as long as you can compile to this low level language. Second, since uh, smart contracts are positioned as this general mechanism for implementing replicated computations, uh, it's better them to be Turing complete because then we have no restrictions about which logic can be implemented this way. Well, finally, and this is more a philosophical question, how should we perceive smart contracts as regulators of certain arbitration between multiple parties? And the common opinion that we should consider them as the law, because if not, what else can we consider as a way to ensure uh, the outcome of this computation. So with these givens come certain pitfalls. And the first pitfall is that if we agree that the base language uh, in which the smart contracts are going to be deployed is a low level one, it makes it very difficult to audit and verify those contracts. We need to have dedicated tools. We can publish papers about it, but it's certainly not going to make our life easier. So Turing completeness is also a double-edged sword. Uh, even though it gives us a lot of expressivity, it also requires for qu quite complex semantics, uh, resource accounting, and ultimately leads to multiple exploits. Well, finally, if we consider code as low, then we have no way to, um, to uh, so we cannot get away without really understanding the code. And if the code is written in a low-level language, that, well, see the point one, that becomes very difficult. So uh, what's the problem with complex semantics? Well, here's uh, an extension of our uh, accounting contract written in Solidity, now complemented with the method called withdrawal balance. So this is a very famous exploit that now many people are aware of. And what happens here is that at some point the contract needs to uh, orchestrate the transfer of money that it contains uh, to some other party. The problem is that the semantics of this uh, transfer of money in Ethereum conflates uh, the said transfer of money, but also the call to another contracts. And now you can think of the contracts as these actors that communicate with each other, and this other contract to which the money has been transferred turns out to be an adversarial. So by exploiting the semantics, it can in fact uh, call this method withdraw balance again, and do so again and again, eventually depleting it of all the money. So this is a very famous attack on smart contracts, exem um, exemplified by the DAO contract, and it's called reentrancy. Obviously, once this thing happened, that provoked a lot of interest in the form of verification in PO community, papers like this started to come, and like this one, and like this one. So altogether, this is a really nice area to do research because a lot of verification and PL inside can be lifted. Well, uh, if since you are here anyway, so there is going to be a really interesting talk tomorrow, which you are welcome to attend, which is also about detecting certain vulnerabilities in smart contracts. So uh, as much as it is fun to look for vulnerabilities in something that is implemented in Ethereum, uh, my quarters and myself try to pose a different challenge. And the challenge is how can we prevent many, if not all, of, that vulnerabil of those vulnerabilities with a slightly more conservative but somewhat principled programming language design. And to accomplish this agenda, we set ourselves a wish list of what such a programming language needs to have. So uh, first of all, we really want to make the interaction between the contracts explicit. And uh, that, for example, would allow us to with things such as reentrancy attacks. We want our language to be minimalistic so it would be possible to fully formally specify and reason about. We want to have an explicit control of effects because then we can know uh, precisely what the contract is doing without relying on certain implicit elements of it. Obviously, we want it to be expressive for the purposes of uh, running of implementing the computations that people are interested in. But at the same time, we want to make it amenable for analysis and for more verification. We cannot really predict all the things that people will care about in the smart contracts, but we want to cater for their need to run their own analysis and verification procedures. For the purpose of uh, for the purpose of reason about the resources that these contracts consume when they are executed in a predicated way, we also want to have something that allows for predictable resource consumption. So this is something known as gas analysis in smart contract community. And finally, we really want to deploy it on some real blockchain. So when it's implemented with all these nice characteristics, we also want to have a reasonable performance given that we are not going to deploy the low level language. We are going to deploy the high level language. So to accommodate all this wish list, we had to reconsider the givens of the smart contracts and give up on some of them. So first of all, as I said, we decided to get away from uh, doing the low-level language because that makes it very hard to reason about the contracts and do the analysis. And second, we decided to give up on the Turing completeness. As nice as it is to have, we uh, decided to limit ourselves to this class of applications that people really write 
uh, using the smart contracts? And if you think of those as replicated state transition systems, or do you really need each transition of those uh, automata to be uh, implemented using while loop? So finally, code is low is something that is here to say, but as long as our language is declarative enough, it should be easy to interpret it. And as such, we designed the first proposal and wrote this language with uh, two of my co-authors, and that proposal has been put on archive and, he's been, and has been there for almost two years. So the nice thing about that proposal that it was, it had a prototype which was fully implemented in Coq with a formal semantics, so at least we knew what kind of properties we can, um, we can have. But it took us almost two years to take this proposal off the ground and deploy it on the real blockchain. And in the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about some findings and some pitfalls and some adjustments that we had to make to this proposal in order to make it viable, viable and make people use it. So as uh, the proposal has been put initially, we proposed, we had a really simple computation model for the smart contract. So in fact, we decided not to reinvent the wheel and just adopt the system F, the polymorphic lambda calculus with, sim uh, with simple ex extensions as the base computational model. So the contracts are not too incomplete. They don't have a general recursion. They only have the primitive structure recursion, which is equivalent to interaction. That has some interesting ramification on how easy is it to do the resource analysis, because if you only have iterations, then um, the resource analysis becomes really, really simple and it's also quite compositional. Second, the language uh, on a syntactic level distinguishes between uh, effectful and unaffectful code. And to accommodate the explicit effects, it has a pretty uh, straightforward state transformer semantics. Finally, and this is probably the most important design decision, we decided to consider contracts to be explicitly structured as autonomous actors. So all the communication boundaries would be enforced at the level of uh, syntax of the program. So I would like to first emphasize this last aspect of Scylla, which is the name of our proposal, namely considering smart contracts as autonomous uh, actors. The model of interaction uh, between the contracts is such is that contracts are reactive. So contracts cannot modify itself. There always should be a call from the outside by some user who holds an account. But once that happens, the contract receives a message. And to this message, the contract can uh, synchronously react by emitting a number of other messages, some of which might go to other contracts, some of which might go to other accounts. And this is the way it's going to continue until we hit the certain limit of how many messages can there be. And this is the communication model that each transaction conforms to. Why, why is it nice? Why is it better than what we've seen in Ethereum where contracts just call each other? Well, it's nice because if we linearize this particular execution, we will see that each contract's evolution only depends on the messages that it receives, but not on the state of other contracts. And furthermore, it's very convenient for the verification purposes that if we don't believe the contracts with which we interact, we can just forget about them and only think about uh, the messages that each particular contract can receive and its reaction. And that makes the verification of the contracts quite modular and, um, and self-contained. So with this explicit interaction, we fulfill the first point of our list. And naturally, since there is no way for the contract to call another one before finishing its transition, it automatically prevents the reentrancy attack. So the rest becomes quite straightforward. So about the minimalism, just a couple of words. So the language comes with full formal semantics, which initially has been implemented in Coke, but as the language grew now, uh, so we still have a formal semantics, but it's not, it's not fully mechanized. So here are the types. You can notice uh, mostly usual things, but we also need to have a number of uh, different integers, and this is different uh, integers of different bit depths. So this is dictated by the practical concerns because the contracts need to be stored on the blockchain, and so is their state. That's why we cannot give them the arbitrary large um, bit depth. So here is the pure functional component. This is just system F with algebraic data types. Nothing particularly unusual here. The interesting component that I would like to emphasize is our use of structural recursion. For example, instead of providing loops, we provide a number of recursion uh, primitives on uh, a number of inductive data types. For example, in addition to the integers, which are flat, we have nested natural numbers, which we have um, borrowed from systems like uh, Coq, and we automatically generate recursion principles for those. So here is, for example, a recursion principle for natural numbers, which looks very familiar to most of you. This is just a mathematical induction principle. So uh, it's, it's polymorphic, it has a result type, it has the value for zero, it has the iterator, and it takes the number of iteration, and finally it returns the result. So it takes a little bit of training to start programming with those, but uh, after, after all, that becomes quite fun. So for example, this is an implementation of Fibonacci numbers, and the nice thing about that, that with this implementation, it's very easy to analyze the complexity. A couple of words about the effectful state, uh, statements. Again, as you can see, the syntax is very minimalistic. I'm just going to highlight some of the crucial components. Uh, 
uh, we have the standard interaction with the state. Uh, the syntax allows to distinguish whether the statement is effectual or it's a pure f f call. And now there comes uh, something more specific to the blockchain. So you can think of the blockchain as a big state which is available in read-only mode during the transaction. So there is a special support for determining when we interact with such, such as reading from the blockchain. And also there are three types of effects that the contract can produce, such as explicitly accepting the funds that someone is willing to transfer it, uh, emitting the event notifying the world about something, some changes in its state, and sending the messages, but that is something that happens synchronously at the end of the contract execution. There is a very um, uh, simple mechanism for supporting errors, and something that we had to add post factum after having done some practical evaluation of the language are in-place map operations. I, I'm not going to elaborate too much on them, uh, but this is something that we have, and the purpose was to uh, have more efficient executions. So this is about the minimalism. How do I determine that the language is minimalistic? Well, it has uh, semantics that fits uh, into one page of uh, OOPSLA proceedings, and also the core interpreter, which is written in Okamo, is less than 200 lines of code. So uh, about explicit control of effects. So this is something that I've already shown how it's supported in the language itself. Let's look at the structure of the contract. So the contracts themselves, they are partitioned into two parts. The library of pure functions that anyone on the blockchain can reuse with no danger because those are, do not depend on any state, and the contract itself. So the contract itself has a number of mutable parameters, a number of mutable fields, and also three transitions. Here, for example, we have the crowdfunding co contract that allows people to donate, allows to um, the owner to get the funds when the campaign is successful, and allows the backers to claim uh, their funds back. So these are all the transitions that are independent, and you can think of them as of atomic units of execution. Zooming in on one of the transitions, such as donate, we can see what it's uh, composed from. So it has parameters which determines what kind of uh, elements the message that triggers it must have. It also has a number of pure function calls that essentially encapsulate all the interest and logic of the contract, but make it very easy to reason about it because it's pure and it's referentially transparent. It interacts with the blockchain. It interacts with the state of the contract. Uh, it also accepts the money, but only in a certain scenario, and this is made uh, uh, very explicit by the use of this uh, command. And finally, it caters for the messages that it's going to send back to the parties that interact with it. So as such, we have the explicit control of effects. Um, for example, acceptance of funds, it's very difficult to write a contract that just does something implicitly. So, and I th we consider it a good thing, even though it introduces quite a bit of verbosity to the language. So speaking about verbosity, uh, now as we have the language design, it's probably enough to convince ourselves that the language is good, but we need to do some harder work to convince the community that this is the language that they want to program it. And the only way to assess the expressivity of the language is to write code in it. So uh, some of this code has been written in-house, some of the code has been written in-house, but not by the authors of this paper, but by people who don't have uh, an extensive training in computer science. We wrote the standard library, which was nice, uh, nicely, nicely small, something that uh, describes the interaction with the list, booleans, natural numbers, and standard collections. And then we wrote what we consider a representative selection. These are the 10 contracts, which are the most popular contracts on Ethereum blockchain, at least in terms of how much the, co uh, the code of those has been copied. And you can spot some familiar uh, standards such as ERC20 and ERC122, uh, uh, which are the smart contracts for different uh, kinds of tokens. So as such, we consider the language expressive enough, and we were sort of happy about it. But uh, then uh, we came to the point of evaluating what we are going to call the analysis verification uh, friendliness. And this is a pretty difficult property to quantify, right? So how do we argue that the language is good for the analysis? Well, we try to conjecture what kind of analysis we would like to have. And at that point, we could think of two. So first, we want to show it's possible to analyze the gas usage in a compositional and modular way. And second, we wanted to have something that sort of makes up for the fact that we adopted a pretty simple type system with no substructural types. And this is something that we call cash flow analysis. I only have time to talk a little bit about the cash flow analysis. It's actually a very simple data flow analysis that answers the following question. Consider all the values that the contract has. So those are represented using the standard uh, primitive and algebraic data types. Which of them correspond to money? And whether the handling of this money is happening consistently. So as such, cash flow analysis soundly infers what fields represent money, and it's based on a principle abstract interpretation. Here is the, the, the entire description of its abstract domain. So you can see the lattice is actually very simple. It says something is certainly money, certainly not money. It also caters for data types, and that's it. So if you got top in something, it's highly likely that the use of um, 
data type is inconsistent. And it also takes user annotations for custom tokens. So for example, uh, starting from the cash flow analysis, the only piece of information it knows that certain amount of money can come from the message, and then it can infer that these two fields actually represent money. So we run this on our test suite, and we got quite encouraging results. So the check mark means that this confirms the usual intuition. There are two very interesting uh, particular cases, uh, such as uh, this ERC token, which has no native tokens, and that's why it requires a user annotation saying what should be considered money, and ERC 721, which is non-fungible tokens. So for them, the analysis only determines that the money doesn't leak, but it doesn't really say what represents the money. So with this, we were sort of happy with analysis friendliness, uh, friendliness and we also cater it for predictable uh, resource consumption, we did a little bit of performance evaluation. So important metrics is the size. In this case, we compared how big are our contracts to a similar one in Solidity and VM. We are the same ballpark. And we also ran the performance evaluation, uh, figuring out that the main bottleneck was actually not the execution environment, but the I.O. So this is the figure that we put into the Oopsla paper, but it has been six, fixed since then, and we are much um, better than Ethereum in this regard now. So we were happy with the performance, and with this we completed uh, the wish list. End of story? Unfortunately, no. Well, that's just the beginning of the life cycle of the language. And for the one minute that I have left, I'm just going to briefly say what happened after this language has been proposed and after it has been deployed on the blockchain. So we uh, deployed this language in June 2018 uh, in Zilliqa testnet, and this June it went live, and since then dozens and hundreds of contracts have been written and thousand transactions have been um, made, even millions of transactions have been made. It's quite heartwarming to see the workshops in the language that I cannot really understand, explaining how to program in this language and spreading the joy of functional programming into the community. So there were IDs contributed by community, the block explorers, and uh, in terms of the adoption, Zilliqa is the fifth by the number of uh, nodes supported, so I think it's a pretty nice playground to assess the viability of the programming language. To conclude, so I'm not going to iterate again all the nice properties of the language. Instead, I'm going to draw some lessons of what uh, of the journey that we had. So uh, it seems like a good idea to adopt minimalistic calculus uh, for uh, designing a language like that because it makes it very easy to reason about and it also keeps it expressive. And also it makes it very easy to reduce uh, reduce ideas from the PL research, which we have many. Uh, but we have to uh, embrace the fact that the language will be growing and we need to cater for this change. Finally, uh, and it's should be emphasized more in this conference, it really pays off to build an enthusiastic community that provides a lot of feedback and tells what can be made better in the language and what are the common patterns that people experience. With that, I invite you to take a look at the paper and the web page, and I'll stop here. Thank you. Yeah, so one thing that always shows up in, in Ethereum contracts like uh, is the use of contextual information like the message caller or stuff like that is used for authentication um, or abuse for authentication, I would rather say. Um, I didn't see any of that uh, being expressible in Scylla, so how do we, what's the substitute for in Scylla contracts? Well, okay, so the question is how do we implement authentic uh, authentication? So we don't have specific support just for authentication. Uh, all the validation of this kind is just implemented in vanilla code of the transition that is welcome to accept or reject certain message depending on uh, the state of the contract. But how do, how do you know who called you? Like, how do you? Well, uh, the contract should have enough state to uh, differentiate between uh, the good and the bad colors. So this done on the... How do you know that? Oh, like there is oh, there is there is an explicit field in the message saying that there is a th th this is an emitter of the message, and you can you can reason. Ah, okay, that. so yeah, I see. I'm sorry, I should have emphasized that. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, is so you have structural recursion. Uh, has that been a problem in to express programs, and you ever need to go back to sort of well-founded recursion? Okay, so the question is, uh, how uh, did we experience any problems with uh, structure recursion? Well, uh, the only problematic uh, cases when structure recursion is not going to cut it is efficient implementation of divide and conquer algorithms, such as, for example, it's pretty difficult to implement quick sort if you only have uh, structure recursion. Uh, we did not experience that much of that many of those use cases, and so far we thought it would be fine to have something that we can reason about termination of automatically. In the future, if it prevails, we can think about integrating the custom termination measures into the language. Thank you. Okay, let's thank you again. Thank you.